It's December 1st, 2020. I have nothing pithy to add other than it's time for the knee jerks. He toward sports talk of Eno and Big Al. I'm the guy who can't think of anything to say at the moment. Al Beaton, longtime Detroit-based podcaster and blogger. Joining me as always is the man who knows a lot of things about a lot of things and is a slave to his cuter than hell dog, and that would be Greg Eno. How's things, Greg? Well, I hope that you've got something to say uh, for the next 80 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be one hell of a... Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> I, mean. uh, I am uh, doing well, uh, Al. Thank you so much. I am Greg Eno from my WordPress uh, Out of Bounds blog. You can catch me there. My Usually once a week I put something new up. I did My most recent piece was uh, was written Monday in the wake of the uh, Matt Patricia and Bob Quinn firings, which, mm-hmm. are, which we will be talking about very shortly. Uh, follow me on Twitter at Greg Eno. And of course, follow the New Jerks on Twitter at the knee jerks. Um, we have uh, lots of lions, of course, to talk about some pistons as well. Uh, and if we have some time, we might get into a little bit of some other things as well. But uh, uh, for now, we're going to just stick to those two topics and see where it takes us. We have um, big news in both of those areas. So we're going to probably devote most of our show to that. But before we get to Al's, mm-hmm. we're going to play a game that we like to call whose birthday is it maestro? Everybody knows how I play this game by now. I give Al a clue or two or three of an individual whose birthday it is today in the world of sports. And if Al can correctly guess that person within the first two clues, he will win an action uh, seat that was from the old Jarry Park in Montreal. So, oh, geez. That's, uh, well, that's a deep cut. <laughs> 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 yeah, what's uh, right. and you know, if you were sitting in there back today, you'd get to see Le Grand Orange, which was uh, Rusty yeah. Staub, yes, or the big cat Andre Galarraga. Didn't Rusty pass away recently? I no, I'm not sure. I really, I, I really couldn't tell I you. 2020 took so many people. I, I know so. you're right. One of them. Um, this person, Al, uh, named, speaking of baseball, was. Mm-hmm. He made his name in baseball. He was born in this state in 1948, so he's 72 years old today. Uh, big time um, hitter, slugger of the 1970s. Mm-hmm. Um, tell you which team yet. I will tell you though that he was uh, his big his his big, big years came in the National League West. I will tell you that. If I tell you the team, you might, might give it away. But the National League West uh, outfielder. Uh, incredible um, power numbers in the in, in the mid to late seventies, and uh, but started his uh, career in the same division, mm-hmm. but with a different team. Huh. National League West, so we're talking like you know Dodgers. Uh, God. The old West. The, the old, yeah, the old, the yeah, the old, the old, the old West. Astros, so. yeah. and it was a big time slugger in the seventies. Started for uh, God. There's a few names floating around there. Shoot, you know, and then trying to think about who was in the West in the 70s, you know, the NL West in the 70s. Like I said, things have changed so much over the years. So um, I'm just going to throw a name out there. Jimmy Wynn. No, no. not Jimmy Wynn. I think that's a little too early, but uh, but you know, he would have been in the West. I know he, was, I mean, he had his best years with the Astros, so I had to go for deep cut just for hell, just for giggles there, so. <laughs> Toy Cannon. Yep. The, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> All right. With that, uh, I think we should just get to, right to the topics at hand because both the Lions and Pistons have given us a hell of a lot to discuss. Even though with the Lions, I think we we've seen this coming for a while, and with the Pistons, I'm not. I don't think anybody's surprised that moves were made. I just think people were surprised at how quickly and how many moves were made. So. With that, though, we'll start about the hot talket in town, and that would be the Detroit Lions. And since we last talked, Greg, the Lions have had a couple of very bad losses. Uh, they were uh, a 20 nothing road defeat to a very short-handed handed Panthers team. Uh, they were QB'd by an XFL refugee. They were missing some of their best players, uh, including their all-pro running back. And it was a game their Lions were never really in. And that, I, I think a lot of people were betting that Matt Patricia and possibly Bob Quinn would have been fired after that game, but it was a short week. So that probably bought them some time, which led us to Thanksgiving, which was probably just as bad because it was an embarrassing nationally televised 41-26 Thanksgiving Day blowout loss, and the game wasn't that close. <laughs> you know, you know the, 
the Lions had up. The Lions had some garbage time points. It really was not a very entertaining game. I think that has a lot to do with it. You know, these games, let alone being blowouts, the Lions were playing a very uninspiring brand of football. And of course, you no know, Texans who the, who beat the Lions on Thanksgiving Day were a three and seven team who had already done the deed and had fired their coach and GM Bill O'Brien like a month ago. So. The Lions essentially fell flat on their face against a couple of struggling teams, uh, one nationally televised. And with Sheila Ford Hamp's infamous statement last year of she wanted to see meaningful December games, well, with the Lions spiraling out of control at what I believe they're four and seven right now, and they look really, really bad, she pulled the trigger on Saturday after Thanksgiving. I think. People thought of, you know, people were expecting maybe if it was going to come down, it was going to be Monday, or even then, maybe just wait till the end of the year. But she uh, pulled the trigger. Her and uh, Rod Wood held a press conference Saturday afternoon, putting out the word that uh, the Lions were moving on from the Quintricia era. And the Patriots of the Midwest experiment, Greg, was a complete and utter failure. Uh, over four seasons, four plus seasons of GM, Bob Quinn was in his fifth year. Uh, his record was 31-43-1, and, and the best years of that record were under Jim Caldwell, who he unceremoniously fired to hire Matt Patricia. And Patricia's record, I believe, ends up being the fourth worst ever in Lions history at 13-29-1. and one. Uh, Offense coordinator Daryl Bevel has been named interim PC, uh, PC yeah, eight, uh, HC head coach. And now, essentially, it's, they're going to play out the string and it's hurry up and wait because we're going to hear a lot of rumors, but not much can happen hiring-wise until the end of the season, and we still got five games to go. But I was somewhat surprised because I was beginning to buy into it. They're just going to let them play out the string, and they'll make the decision at the end of the year. But old Sheila pulled the trigger, which in some ways – I'm happy she did, but this is something that should have happened last offseason, essentially making this a completely wasted year. Yeah, I, I also was a little surprised uh, that it happened. Um, well, let's put it this way. Earlier in the year when you and I talked about this, mm -hmm. I was very pessimistic that any move would be made during the season. Yeah. I was very adamant that he would survive the season, Patricia would, and would be canned on you know, Black Monday. Like yeah, it just wasn't a Ford thing to do. But as, it, as the season, right, but as the season wore on, um, it became evident that it was really, um, I mean, he had completely lost it. It was just, yeah. I mean, the, the, the performances were getting worse and worse. The, the, the uh, margins of, of defeat were getting broader and broader, and there was just absolutely no improvement whatsoever. If anything, it was just constant, um, you know, regression every yeah. week. And clearly those last two games against two middling teams – uh, you mentioned the XFL quarterback for Carolina. And then yeah, the, P.J. Wright, I believe it was his name. And the well, I had never heard of before. Had no idea who he was. Yeah, I mean, it was it was really not. You know, I mean, it's one thing to get blown out by the Green Bay's of the world and so yeah. forth, but when you're getting blown out by Carolina and, and at Houston and you know, and it, it would have been worse because uh, he threw two of the worst end zone interceptions you'll ever see. Right. It should right. have been a a, a a thirty-five point blowout. Right. You talk about the, the kid from Carolina. Yeah. Yeah. And Carolina then, game. Um, you know, then of course the, the second of those two losses was played out on national television, and and, yep. and I don't know if Sheila Fordhamp was was watching the game on television from her uh, box or not, but you know the oh commentary. she was in the box. I don't know if you saw the picture that M I, saw a picture, but I, yeah. I don't know if yeah. you had the game on. You know, yeah. you could hear right. Tony Romo and Jim Nance who were kind of kind of laughing at the Lions at times, and that was not a good look. Yeah, what else could you do? It was that bad of a game. Yeah. Yeah, so um, that was played out in, 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 on the national stage, and that didn't help. And um, it, then it became the opposite. It became that would have been a, it would have been egregious not to have fired him. Yeah. Uh, because in the last five games, I don't know, it just I don't know what would have played out, but it just to have kept him on then just for uh, that would have been a joke. I, I was more I was more surprised that she fired Bob Quinn as well. I thought that might she might wait till the end of the season to do Quinn. But she mm -hmm. did them both at the same time, and I, I applaud her for making good on her word. She did yeah. say last year, before she was owner, she said that we were, we are looking at playing meaningful games in December. Clearly, that's not happening, mm -hmm. and so she made good on her word. Yeah. And uh, this was her first major move, obviously, since taking over as principal owner in June, and and uh, now she's got a, a you know 
the easy part is probably what the move that she made. The hard right. part now is because anybody can give her to somebody who's not doing a good job. Then right. the hard part is finding somebody who is going to do a good job, and that's that's what the Lions have not been able to get right low these many years. But but this was a, a dead man walking, Patricia. He was, uh, you know, just it was just a, a, a farce what was happening on the field. He, he had to be like he had to be fired. Yeah, and I believe that uh, the reason it went down on Saturday rather than Friday was, uh, I know, I think Dave Burkett was one of the uh, beat writers that reported this, is that it was they were discussing what to do with Quinn, if they were going to keep him or not. And I find it hard to, I find it hard to believe that it, was, it took that much discussion to figure out, well, you got to shoo him out the door as well, because this, uh, uh, this is a, uh, a franchise that really needs a complete flush you know, the, you know, the, the need to essentially broom anybody and everybody for the most part, and it's in this start over from scratch, tear down from the studs because it's obvious it hasn't worked, it wasn't going to work, and unfortunately now the Lions are because they kept they went this extra year, or you know and we're into what well three quarters of a season at this point, they're stuck with some. Contracts that aren't exact. Well, I, I won't call them toxic, but they got some pretty big contracts. They probably got to ride out for a couple of years, like Trey Flowers. They have several players, especially on the defense, who are very scheme specific. That, well, you know, if you bring, you know, bring in another when you bring in another regime, odds are you're either going to have to kind of shuffle things around with these guys, or you're just going to have to bite the bullet and uh, move on from them. Guys like Tavai and. Uh, uh, you know, Raglan. I mean, there's a there's a bunch of others, and a lot of the expatriates. I guess is what I'm what I'm pointing to, and some of the draft picks specifically, which were, you know, guys who sh- who only fit in, in a Patricia scheme, or or at least a Patriot style scheme. So, you know, it, you know, it was time. Both had to go. I can't believe it, was, it even took them this long to do it. I mean, it, it, honestly, this could have happened a month ago, and no one would have argued about it. But the one of the you know, I don't, and I'm not one to rag on people what they say in press conferences, especially ones that are held over Zoom, uh, and and are held on a holiday weekend or, or you know press conferences anyway. You know, pe- people say things, and I'm not. You know, it's you know they're tr- they're answering questions and trying to be a little extra impar- and trying to you know they're speaking off the cuff a little bit. When she said, I thought two weeks. She said two weeks ago, I thought we still had a chance at the playoffs. That was, I don't know if she honestly believed that and was just saying that to explain why she they kept on a charade of keeping these guys employed, or she honestly believed it. I don't know, and that's kind of one of the things that bothered me because I think anyone with half a brain who had watched any of these games thought that it was going to take a, you know, a miracle for this team to actually turn things around and make a playoff run because you know, this was, I have not seen a team play more uninspiring football. Hell, I think the 0-16 team at times played more interesting football than this one did. I'll put it that way. Well, yeah, that's true. And here's the thing, too, Al. Usually when you when you get into a losing situation where there's mm-hmm. the playoffs are now, you know, not a possibility, right. when the coach is still in place, typically those last four or five games are when players – you know they're playing for jobs. They're playing for right. hopefully just to keep their job or to, or maybe to impress somebody else in the league. You know, there's there's a lot of selfish reasons to play in those mm-hmm. last five games, which is fine. I, yeah, I'm I'm okay with that. But now you're in a situation where you don't know who the coach is going to be next year. Mm-hmm. And even if we say that Daryl Bevel is is a candidate, and, and he may be. I mean, let's hey, if they run the table or go four and one, I don't know why why he wouldn't be a candidate. But mm-hmm. you know, player for the most part, of the players there's a lot of uncertainty now. They don't know who's the GM, who the GM's going to be, who the coach is going to be, and so yeah, they're playing for jobs. But for who? I mean, are they yeah. playing? Are they trying to impress the current staff? Are they trying to impress just the league in general? Because of course, mm-hmm. everybody's got film on everybody. Right. I would imagine they're just trying to impress the league in general. Just trying to, you know, there's a lot of at stake uh, here. You mentioned some bad contracts. I would, I would add that. Uh, that offensive lineman from Philadelphia, but oh yes, yes, was, uh, but time. Uh, you know that was very questionable. But yeah, Quinn. You know, ultimately, Al. I mean, he had five drafts. He had five um, uh, free seasons, if you will. And there was just too many. It was just too spotty. It just was not. You know, for everyone he may have hit on, there were probably two or three that he didn't. And yeah. and it just wasn't good enough. It just wasn't. And that's and that's showed on the field. This was. I mean, this was Bob Quinn. 
you know, back in 18, when he fired, or 17, 18, when he, when he right. fired Caldwell, okay, yeah, there may, might have been a couple of holdovers left over from the Martin Mayhew days or whatever. But now this is unquestionably Bob Quinn's team. I mean, right. they, they, they five seasons, this is unquestionably his team. And the product on the field is just, it just isn't there. I mean, it's just, yeah. they don't have any, any, any speed or athleticism on the, in the linebacking core. The front, the, the defensive line is okay. It's okay. They're stopping a run, but they can't pass, rush the passer to save yeah, their the, lives. They can't rush the passer, and, and the, like I said, the linebackers are bad. And then the, yes. the, 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 the secondary is in flux. There's a lot of, you know, I know he's tried He's tried real hard to, 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 to put together a good offensive line, and and he's had some some, some success, Ragnow and and, and uh, Taylor Decker, of course, and, you know, he's had okay success on the offensive line, mm-hmm. but there's just too many – misses you know tease Tabor at cornerback the second round um you know jared uh, davis is is highly questionable yeah. for what he was drafted there just were too many misses and in also in the free agent class too many misses free agency wise as well it's a very some head scratching you know um parting of the ways you know golden tate and yeah we and, and we've had, talked about uh, some of the ro- the roster mismanagement or they think how Assets have been shuffled around in bizarre ways, like like you brought up the Vatai contract this year, and he's barely played due to a combination of injury and effectiveness. When they had a perfectly very good ta- uh, guard in uh, in, in uh, Jansen, oh, yeah, Glasgow, I'm sorry, Glasgow, Grant Glasgow, who they let walk in free agency, and then in the draft this past year, they take two guards. In the third and fourth rounds, in the four, in the guy in the fourth round hasn't even played. So essentially, you signed a free agent and drafted two players to replace a guy you left walking free agency. Uh, and obviously, you bring up the when you talk about the Darius Slay situation, where they got rid of him because he was not a culture fit. They signed a Trufant, who can't stay on the field and has not been very good, and draft Jeff Okuda, who looks completely lost right now and in over his head. Uh, in his uh, rookie season, you know, who, Okuda could still become a good player, but as yeah. of right now, he is not, and, he, and he's not even close to being a replacement for Darius Slay. Uh, oh, the, the running back situation, you know, constantly taking running backs. You've taken two in the last four years. You've taken running backs in the second round twice. The first time with uh, uh, with God, who am I thinking? Of? Who's the uh, Johnson? Yeah, uh, Carryon Johnson. Who, uh, who has essentially become a role player at this point. He comes on the pass block for the most part. And obviously they, t- they drafted Swift as his replacement. And then they pick up a guy off the scrap heap. And uh, Adrian Peterson, who was averaging like two to three yards a carry and yet gets the bulk of the carries. I mean, the asset management has been completely screwed up over the past couple years. Uh, and it's going to take a couple, two, three seasons to get it all sorted out again and figured out where they're going to go with this. Because in the end, it really looks like Quinn and Patricia really botched up this roster horribly, and it's going to take some time to figure out how to get the hell out of it, let alone there's the Matthew Stafford question. That's the big elephant right. in the room right now. Right, exactly, Because which was not a question when Bob Quinn took over, but mm-hmm. now that, that, that many more years have gone by, yeah. and so now it is a question. I mean, yeah. Matthew's going to be, I think, 33 next year. Yep. Certainly before next season begins. Yep. and. You know, uh, 12 years in the same quarterback in the same city, and, and uh, you know, he, even he's kind of noncommittal to what is going to happen with him. That says volumes. This is, and this is a guy who has always said how much he enjoys playing in Detroit and wants to win with the Lions. And he, even he's now saying, I'm just going to wait and see. But you know what? The, you mentioned you mentioned at the top of the discussion, you said, you know, yeah. this has got to be a total teardown, studs yep. all the way down. Well, if you're going to do that, you, you may as you well get rid of him. I mean, yeah. may, I mean, if that's what if that's what it's going to be, um, then you may as well truly start from scratch. Uh, even yeah. Sheila Fort Hamp, I, I watched her little Zoom call there that was posted on YouTube, and, yeah. and we asked her about Matthew Stafford, and she said, "I will let the the next GM and coach make that that decision." So even yeah, I, which was very smart of her, with, yeah, because we saw what happened with Caldwell when Martha Ford said, "Oh, I love Jim Caldwell." when they brought in Bob Quinn, and that immediately handcuffed him. So she's being smart that way and saying it's up to the new regime. 
If they want to trade Stafford, we'll talk about it then. And that's per, that's the right attitude to take at this point. Well, they, that's, you know, they, they just, you know, I, I, you know, I, you know, I've been my relationship with the Lions has has been fractured lately. But yeah. I will say though that if if the fans want to look for any sort of sign of hope with this new owner, uh, mm-hmm. if you will, I know it's it's new in the sense that it, it's not it, she's yeah. still in the same family, but she's right. still new. Is that she did two things that I think should make fans feel a little bit better. Number one, she she made the move. She was decisive. Yeah. She made the move that she did, and at the same time, she took the hands-off approach mm-hmm. when asked about Stafford, like you said. So she, she's shown that she'll she can make the hard decisions, which is, you know, the tough decisions to get mm-hmm. rid of people. But then when it comes to, you know, what's going to happen next, she's like, I'll let my people that I'm going to hire make those decisions. So I think it's a nice blend of, of I'm going to make the tough calls that an owner has to make. But when it comes to the football decisions, I'm going to leave that to the football people. Now, you know, we'll see what happens, but but at least there was no, like you said, there was no gushing. Yeah. They were, oh, Matthew's such a nice young man. There's none, none of that kind of stuff going on. Yeah. It was just basically, you know, she didn't talk like a Ford. She didn't, to me, she didn't yeah. come off like a Ford to me. She came off like her own person. She didn't, she didn't have that stench of the Fords on her. I didn't catch it. I watched mm-hmm. the entire... Um, call and that she didn't seem the only time that scared me that was what you said about being a playoff team and then the other thing she said is i think mm. we're a talented team which that scared me a little bit but if i think that's just press people, conference talk and anything else yeah though. she's gonna bring in some football people the football people I are hope. determine just how talented this roster really is do they have some pieces of course every nfl team has some pieces even the jets mm. yeah. they don't want to love and have some pieces everybody has pieces it's 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 that entire fifty three man roster that that is that takes you all the way, not just six mm-hmm. or seven guys. This isn't you know the NBA where you can have two or three guys lead the team. You have to have a, a lot of depth. And I just go back to I, I keep going back to the linebackers now. I, mm-hmm. the, the, we have the, the Lions have not been able to get the linebacking core right for years. It just has not. They've brought in a lot of people, shuffled a lot of guys around. They've tried different coaches. They just have not had those you know, guys that can bust up plays. No and, difference makers, period. Yeah. Difference makers, exactly. There have not been any. They just haven't been. They're just not yep. there. Uh, and and they're, they're constantly beaten outside. They don't have any speed. This has been going on forever. Yep. They've not been able to, 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 to correct, fix the linebacking situation. They never draft linebackers high. Yep. I mean, I know they, dra- they drafted Davis, but he wasn't the right. He, he thought it wasn't very good. Yeah. He wasn't very good. Uh, he's a he's a situational linebacker. For a mm-hmm. guy that drafted as high as Davis was, I think he, well, he was a first rounder. Wasn't he was he? a first second. round pick, and he's now essentially playing fifteen snaps a game he's, as a pass he's rusher. A situational guy. He, yeah. he, and and I don't even and I don't even know what that situation is because he's not a good mm-hmm. pass defender. Yeah. You know, I, I, he I, comes I, in on passing downs to rush the passer. That's all he does yeah. at this point because he so, can't do anything else very well. Yeah, you mentioned asset management. I think I think you hit the nail on the head. I think I think it's a good way to put it. Um, there's been a, you know there, there's that whole thing about work smarter, not harder. Yeah, the Lions have worked very hard mm-hmm. to, to correct these holes, but, but they're not working very smart. Yeah, well, think about the, right now. If, uh, if under con only they have one wide receiver who's going to be under contract at the end of the season. One, you know, and and that's the fifth round pick, uh, Cephas out of Wisconsin. Mm-hmm. I mean, all, no. Every other wide receiver this team has is a free agent. What you know? And one of them, uh, Carry on John, uh, Carry on Johnson. I'm sorry, uh, Kenny Galladay. Uh, it is a legit number one receiver. You can argue, is he a top ten receiver? He's a top twenty right. receiver. He's still a. Right. He's essentially the best receiver on this team. This is a guy who had double digit touchdowns last year. He is Matt Stafford's security blanket. He is a legit difference maker for this team we don't even know if they've negotiated anything with them because this really start with when Quinn was still in charge this was starting to feel like another Patriots thing where they refused to give big money to anybody for the most part uh, and they just replaced them with someone else who fits into their system but the thing is Quinn has been doing this and he's been replacing them with worse players as we've seen in the defensive backfield, for example. So now we're, we're stuck with uh, Marvin Hall and, uh, and uh, Galladay and uh, Jones. Uh, all these, every single receiver, uh, Amendola, every single one of them 
as a free agent at the end of the year. And that makes absolutely no sense. And now that's handcuffing the next regime because if you want to keep Galladay, odds are you're probably going to have to franchise tag him at this point. And the moment you franchise tag a player, you piss him off to no end. And odds are he's going to leave the following year. You know, that's just how things work in the NFL when it comes to the franchise tag. It's a last resort kind of thing. But uh, this team, you know, you have an aging quarterback. You have uh, – uh, offensive line that has nice pieces, but as yet showing to gel. his age, by the way, Al. Yes, you're right. Showing his yes, age. and yeah, who's who was essentially been, this this year has been bad. I haven't, I haven't These, seen for, like Matt Stafford's standards. This is a bad year. This year has been um, mm-hmm. not very good. He's yeah, been, I don't know how many how many guys he's missed, just flat out missed. Yeah, um, and uh, yeah, he can still make the occasional nifty little sidearm throw, and yeah. he can make the occasional. Um, thread the thing through the needle kind of a deal, but you know, for the most part, he's missing throws that are, yeah. you know, I, I, most NFL quarterbacks would make consistently, and he's been missing them. Yeah, and it says it really says something when Dan Orlovsky, you know, who now the uh, former Lions quarterback, who is uh, now a, a very good analyst for ESPN, yeah. and has a, been a very, very probably the biggest backer of Matthew Stafford in the media right now. There's always talked up Stafford. He actually, they're friends. But yeah. he's also he has also said how much he thinks, how talented he thinks Stafford is. And when he comes out and says, I think it's time for Stafford to move on, <laughs> I think that really kind of, you'd have to believe if Orlowski is saying that, you have to think Stafford's thinking the same thing. I, you know? I can't blame him. You know, I, I, yeah. I, 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 the thing is, Al, I don't know, I don't know what the value is the market value is for a guy like him anymore because you know if I'm you and I are with our untrained eye are you know we I know we, we have watched a lot of football over the years yeah. but we're not as trained as some of these other folks who watch the, who watch the league and watch film. Right. If we are if we are seeing that Matt is pressing and is missing throws and so forth, uh, making bad decisions, which he was never a great decision maker to begin with, but mm-hmm. if we're seeing that, what are what are people around the league seeing? I mean, yeah. What are people? Around, and I'm, not, I'm not talking about the announcers who do the games. I'm talking about the people who are in the, yeah. you know, the other the scouts, the, the, league, the, scouts the other the right. other scouts around the league, the, the personnel directors, right. the, the, the people who would make decisions for the other teams. As far as would we be interested in a guy like Stafford? You know. I don't know what his market value is. I mean, forget the money. I'm not talking. I'm not talking about his contract value. Right. I mean, I don't know what his value is in terms of what you could get for him right. if you wanted to make a trade or do something with him. I don't know. Uh, I don't know where, where what, the, what other football people see in him in terms of what they, where they would slot him. I, I would think they would still consider him an above average quarterback. Yeah. But I don't know if they would consider him being a guy that they could they could ride to. the the promised land, unless they feel like they, you know, how many how many teams in the NFL are just a quarterback away? It's hard to say that. It yeah. seems funny to say because quarterback is such an important position to say, you, I, we have a roster that's just a quarterback away. I don't know mm-hmm. if there's any roster that really is. A, now, there's a lot of rosters that are quarterback away from being bad if their quarterback goes down. I could make a joke about the Broncos right now, but. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they were, they were four quarterbacks away. Yeah, so. right. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, like it's uh, Rifko, for God's yeah, sake. yeah, it's uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's you know the Stafford thing. That's the you know they may end up having to hold on to him for a year, just to let him build up some equity. You know, showing that he he's still in that level, that next level of quarterbacks. You know that you know of that Matt Ryan uh, type of a quarterback, a uh, Philip Rivers. You know, he's kind of a poor man, Philip Rivers. I think it's the best way to describe Stafford. So there is a market for him, but is that market like a second round pick or is it a first round pick or something? You know, it's hard to say. Well, you you know, considering he's had round. he's had injuries the last three years between the uh, the, the two back injuries, the one in, the one back injury knocked him out for half a year, and then this you know, obviously this year with the with the torn thumb ligament. So he's he's damaged goods for one. He's not coming on and he's having a down year, and. Yeah, and, and as you said, he's, he looks to be uh, quite possibly in decline. That's you know, but then again, the disarray and dysfunction of the Lions organization may be playing into that as well. And he might be a guy at this point who's just ready to get the hell out. And we'll, you know, he if he says I want to leave, you know, it's in the Lions' best interest just to get rid of him, eat that cap hit, which is going to be around what twenty million bucks. 
but on a rebuilding team, is that really a big deal? Probably not. Well, if, a guy, if a guy like yeah. Rivers and a guy like Peyton Manning and a guy like um, uh, Brady, they, mm-hmm. they, they all moved, moved around. Yeah. They, yeah. They yeah. All, uh, he, you know, as they play. say, yeah. man, you can magically make his cap room if you really have to, you know, by shuffling contracts around and, and playing around with the, with the money. So if they need to get rid of them, they can. Uh, it, but and I think I th- it'd be best for all parties involved, you know, the team, Stafford himself, the or, you know, uh, the new regime for that matter, the fan base, everybody involved. Is, uh, it's, it's been a it's been a wild twelve years, but I think it's best for everybody that that we change direction under center. It's something that has to be done, and the, you know, cap hit or not, it, it, it should be done at this point. It's it's going to be interesting, though, as you said, the value. Do you trade them if someone says they'll give you a third-round pick? Probably not. You know, but there are some people who say, well, he's worth two first-round picks. No, he's not right now. No, he's damaged no, goods. No, no. But I think you get a low first-round for him because that's what, what, in a perfect scenario, the type of team is looking for him, as you said, would be a quarterback away, which is a team that's borderline playoff or early playoff knockout and needs a quarterback, and that would be a low first-round pick, that sort of team. What that team is... I don't know. That's something that I'd have to do more research in. And it's not my job to do that. My job is to give hot takes anyway. So, <laughs> but speaking of hot takes, uh, Greg, have you ever seen a reaction to a coach being fired that we saw from a lot of Lions expats? No, no. I mean, guys like Darius Slay, Quandre Diggs, Stephen Tullock. I mean, Stephen Tullock, of all people. Uh, a. Sean Robinson, uh, that's just a handful. There's a, there was more than that. They all expressed in no uncertain terms their Sean Freud over the dismissal of Pat, Matt Patricia. I mean, they were honestly hide, trying to hide their joy, not doing a very good job of it. Uh, even Kenny Galladay, as you mentioned earlier, uh, he liked a beat writer or favorited, how, whichever, I don't know if it was Twitter or Instagram, uh, he he liked a social media post from a, one of the beat writers in regard to the firing of Patricia. And another interesting thing is, oftentimes you'll hear uh, players on the current roster, you no, know, say, give say give their pleasantries. You no, know, it was nice working with them. I'm sorry it happened. I wish we would have played better for him or something to that effect. Then there's been nothing in regard to Matt Patricia's departure. You no, know, even when uh, when. Before the firing, and Matt Stafford was asked about it during, a, I think, a post-game press conference about the job status, and all Stafford said was, well, that's not my department. You know, it's not my job to, uh, when it comes to that sort of thing. And there was, you know, there was no uh, signs of support from anybody on the roster. I think the only people that had anything good to say about Patricia over the past year or two have been the expatriates that are now on the team. Everybody else was like, I think they were tolerating him, and they were just biding their time till this guy got his ass fired because, from all accounts, he made for an extremely toxic workplace, especially in that first year or two. You know, and that's, he made the classic mistake of, of a of management mistake of coming into a new organization and instead of getting the lay of the land, maybe sitting back a little bit and observing, just going into it and kind of, I won't say ingratiating yourself, but kind of easing into things, you, you know, gradually ramping up. He came in like a bull in a china shop and com- and completely changed, did a, essentially a complete 180 of Jim Caldwell's culture. And say what you will about Jim Caldwell as a coach, an X's and O's guy, as a management guy, as a leadership guy, as a guy who ran a locker room, he was beloved, and everybody in that organization loved Matt Patricia. Uh, loved Jim Caldwell. Then here comes Patricia, who had never been a head coach in his life, and from all accounts, now it really looked like he was just riding the coattails of uh, of, of of his patriotism, of, of being a Patriots uh, coach of uh, of Bill Belichick riding his coattails. He came in with, with essentially a wrecking ball. And ran these guys into the ground. Was insulting. Was uh, we've heard, we've talked about the stories before. How we insulted guys during uh, 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 during uh, film work. Like he called uh, Darius Slay the c word, which essentially right then and there ruined their relationship. And it took him a couple years to kind of change his 
how we handled the locker room, but by that time it was too late. So Patricia is immensely screwed up from the start. And it was, you know, and it all it really all came to a head when they got blown out by the goddamn Jets in their first regular season game, uh, what, two and a half years ago. And ever since then, it's been a downhill spiral. And Patricia did everything, he, he did everything wrong when it came to coming into this organization. Say what you will about the, this being a, uh, the Lions being a team that has always lost and had issues with, uh, with its culture, so on and so forth. It's even st- when you're replacing a guy who was beloved as Jim Caldwell, you really need to. I'm not saying you don't need to step on walk on eggshells, but you need to tread a little bit light, more a little lighter than you can't come in as Bill Belichick Jr., especially when you don't have the resume. And and, a, and the worst part is he never ever changed, and even more so when it came on to his on-field schemes. What was what was bad that first game against the Jets? was still bad in his last game against the Texans. And I think that more than anything was he was so he was such a slave to his scheme that and and, and he couldn't get the team to buy into it. He was a dead man walking from the start. You know, when you look at it, maybe he felt a, a, a little bit emboldened, maybe too emboldened. Yeah, that's a good Bob way to Quinn, put it. By having Bob Quinn uh, yep. as the guy who hired him and 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 maybe maybe there was a little bit of hubris there and and, I think there's a lot of you, hubris. You can't touch me. I, you know, I'm. He and I are. Remember are, one of the he, greatest he, calls in the history of the NFL. We I mean, <laughs> people, and uh, you know, we, we come from, we're, 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 you know, Super Bowl land and so forth. Um, and but yeah, I mean, the um, the, the the team. Look, I mean, he had, he had 43 games, mm-hmm. and you look at game number one. You mentioned that Jets game, that yeah. infamous game, the game one. Game one, you look at that game. You look at game 43, which was against yeah. Houston on Thanksgiving. And I, I, I don't know how you, you coach 43 NFL games and, and and don't leave the team any better than you were. I mean, they, they right. were just as bad in game one as they were in game 43. I mean, it just there wasn't Arguably any worse. improvement whatsoever yeah. in the 42 games in between. Yeah. And that's stunning when you think about it. I mean, I know, in, like you said, a lot of that might have been that, that just stubbornness of, of uh, mm-hmm. you know, we, we don't blitz, we play man, we do this, we do that, this is the way we're going to do it. And it doesn't work, it doesn't work, doesn't work, we're going to we're gonna do it anyway. And, um, I mean, 43 games, and the, the 43rd game was no better than the first one. And yeah. uh, there were really no highlights in between. That's the other thing, Al. There was mm-hmm. only, I, think there was only, I think I read there was only two he only had two two-game winning streaks during the <laughs> 43 games. Never won three in a row. Mm-hmm. And uh, the closest he came was when they went 2-0-1 yeah. at the beginning of last year. They had three unbeaten games in a row, but no three-game winning streaks. Yep. Um, it's just in a league that's built for parity and and in, in playing not in a great division. I mean, it, you know, I mean, the NFC North isn't isn't the greatest division in the world. I mean, no. uh, and... and um, could never beat the Vikings. Couldn't beat the Bears. Uh, couldn't beat Mitch Trubisky for Christ's sake. Yeah, yeah, and that's the other thing too, Al. They yeah. made a lot of. They made a lot of. You mentioned the kid from the XFL. They made yeah. a lot of average players look really, really good. Yeah, yeah, and and when it comes to the uh, the glee from guys like Slay and uh, Diggs and Robinson and and uh, Eric Ebron was another one. Yeah. Uh, for all the stories that that have come out. You would have to believe there's tons more that have not come out or won't ever really. They'll they'll stay, you no, know, in the locker room. Because I know the beat writers have uh, have talked about that. They have heard things, but they could not confirm them. They there is a lot of rumors floating around about how bad things had gotten in that locker room, especially that first season. And so you'd have to believe that, uh, you know, you'd have you know, you'd have to think that. If anything, this team needed a breath of fresh air from this, the, this overbearing presence that was Matt Patricia. And I think it said, says quite a bit about uh, Daryl Bevel when he came out and said, uh, no, I want these guys to come out here fire. I want these guys to have fun. And you got to wonder, you know, even with the coaching staff, maybe they feel the same way that they were handcuffed by the scheme that Patricia was so insistent in running I mean, I'd have to think Daryl Bevel wants more out of his offense than 
running between the tackles of Adrian Peterson two out of three plays. You know, so and so I I think maybe this whole you know, maybe they're not going to go on this big run, you know, that like that could save, you know, give Bevel the job to win five games and maybe make a playoff run. But at the very least, I have a feeling this team might at least play some more entertaining offensive football because, you know, this bend but don't break bullshit and trying to run the clock to protect his defense is not how you win in today's NFL, and Patricia proved it. You can't win the way he was coaching this team to play, and, and especially handcuffing guys with talent. I mean, we've talked about in the past, you know, Matthew Stafford is at his best when he's running tempo and he's firing the ball all over the goddamn field. He's not a game manager. You're not going to win with him being your game manager. You don't pay a guy $30 million a year to be a game manager anyway. So, you know, I'm not anticipating this team being a lot better that Patricia's gone. But I do think we will see a team that actually might play a little more interesting football and play a little looser and a little more fun. Because, uh, as we've said it over the past few podcasts, the worst thing about this team is not just that they were bad, but they were boring. And, you know, it, it, there's not a worse sin. I mean, I can, you can sometimes forgive a team being bad, considering, you know, if they're rebuilding or making changes, but you cannot forgive a team for just playing boring and uninspired ball. And that's what the t- Lions essentially done for the past three years. Yeah, I mean, how many times are we going to see Adrian Peterson, you know, first and ten, Mm-hmm. Gain a yard, second yep. and ten, gain two yards, and then third. And all of a sudden, now you're behind the you're behind. Yeah, the, didn't he have the, Stafford behind the eight ball trying to make a play? People say behind the chains, yeah. and uh, you know, I, yeah, they're, they're, this wasn't um, you know, like you mentioned, the, the uninspired, and, and we'll, we'll see though. I mean, you know, yeah. I thought Bevel's uh, little phone call. He seemed very excited. He seemed like he was really. But he's got the chance that he's never gotten. He, yeah, he, he wants to see if he can be a head coach. Now. I've got five shots at this, and yep. you know I've always wanted to be a head coach. And and uh, in the, in this in this business, you take the opportunities that are given you. You don't yep. take time to feel sorry for the guy that got fired. You know, uh, yep. you, you 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 take the opportunity and you try to run with it. We'll see what happens. But he did mention Bevel did say a couple times about having fun and one of the reporters yeah. finally said well, are you saying that they weren't having fun he said well then he of course he went he back backtracked a little bit yeah he can say well you know it's not fun when you lose and, you're right but you could kind of tell by his facial expression that he that's what he was kind of trying to say yeah. we these guys weren't having fun under the old regime and now we're going to try to have a little bit of fun loosey-goosey you have nothing to lose you know guys are just going out there like i said trying to play for jobs nothing to lose as far as a playoff positioning goes a season shot Go out there, try to indeed have some fun the last five games, and and just let the chips fall where they may. Right. Bevel's going to have some fun being a head coach, and and maybe there'll be that a little bit of a pall that'll be lifted away from the team. And well, I don't know, like you said, I don't know how that how that translates into wins and losses. Right. We may see a different brand of football in these last five games. Who knows? But like Bevel, I mean, you know, who knows? Like I say, he they, he goes four and one, or God forbid, runs the table. You know, of course he's going to be a candidate. I mean, why pulls wouldn't he be a, a pulls a Gary Moeller, in other words. Yeah, so. I mean, I mean, why wouldn't he be a candidate? Mm-hmm. Um, so you know, well, you know, the tough, the, the, the of course, the part, the tough part about interim coaches, Al, as far as being candidates, is too often they're they're looked they're looked at as being too closely associated with the former yep. coach. But you know, on, on the other hand. Uh, they are two different people. I mean, they're not robots. I mean, these are yeah. two different. You know, Patricia and Bevel are two different people. I can already tell it in the in the phone call I saw with Bevel. Patricia, who was, you know, the, the, the next in, the next, you know, bon mot he says is going to be his first. And the guy oh, that was he was your jerk of the week last podcast for his word salads. He's just, <laughs> you know, that I'm not going to miss that. I'll tell you that much. Yeah, Bevel is like a kid in a candy shop right now. I know it's new for him. Yeah. But uh, he seems a lot more personable, and uh, you know we'll see. Yeah, yeah, it's you know, and when it comes to who's going to be the new G- GM, if they're going to change the front office to maybe add a football operations guy, who's going to be the head? It's way who's going to be the head coach? It's way too early to even speculate on that stuff. You know, a lot of the normal names have been thrown out there. You know, uh, Robert Sala and Eric Bieniemy, Jim Harbaugh, who may be on his last days at Michigan. Who knows? Mm-hmm. I mean, there's been a handful of, you know, there's a lot of the usual yeah. uh, hot coordinators and, you know, sometimes there's some uh, uh, and some hot college coaches and things like that. 
But it's way too early to speculate. I guess my concern is right now, the hiring committee, for the most part, is essentially an accountant and an owner who has not really is not really had a real job other than being a billionaire. So that's my concern is that now that the people who are going to be making the hiring decision, they have don't really have anybody they can lean on. The last time around, Martha went to the NFL and, and they gave her Ernie Corsi as an advisor, and he led them to Bob Quinn. Yeah, we see how that worked out. So I that's my one, I think my concern right now is how they move forward from here. They've, there's been talk, yeah, we're going to, that there's go, they're going to use a, uh, a search firm. But they need more than that to help make this decision. They start needing to lean on some advisors. And I'm kind of starting to, you know, talking myself into, well, maybe it would be a good idea to have guys around like Chris Spielman or uh, or there's a lot of talk of Larry Lee, the ex-right-hand uh, man to Martin Mayhew. Uh, guys like that as advisors or as a sounding board. or You know, kind of like how the Tigers have... Uh, uh, they had Al Kaline and Willie Horton and Alan Trammell as special advisors to the organization. I, I wish the Lions had something like that that would help these essentially neophytes, you know, help them wind their way through the NFL hiring woods because it has to be an overwhelming. And when you think about it, having to rebuild an entire front office, which is likely going to happen, that, that's an overwhelming thing to do when you think about it. And we're talking about two people who aren't football people who are going to do it. So I really don't know. You know but that's my concern. Well, uh, you know, here's Dean, by the way. Mm -hmm. real quick. He's, got, he's got his new Christmas collar. He's got, oh. He's What'd got, you do? <laughs> What'd you do? <laughs> he's got his new Christmas collar. <laughs> If you can see it or not, let's wait for the Skype. Yes, I can see it. Yes, it's on camera right now. He has new Christmas color on. Oh, he was like, I, I want to get back to the tree. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's camera shy apparently. Yeah. So at least at least this kind of camera anyway. What is but it that's now? that's my fear, Greg, is that we have a couple essentially NFL neophytes in charge of hiring a brand new front office. What is it with the Lions, Al? That that they just, with the exception of Matt Miller, who they brought out of the broadcast booth. Right. What is it with why do they keep hiring guys like Chuck Schmidt and mm -hmm. Tom Lawan and Rod Wood? Why can't they put in a bona fide football guy? They had one and they oh. ran him out and he lost the power struggle. That would be what Jerry Venisi. Well, oh, that was years. That, that was years ago. ago. Years ago. Why can't they bring in a guy that's got football acumen? If you want yeah. to keep Rod Wood around for to, to advice, oh, he's done great play. things for the stadium, things like that. You yeah, know, I'm for, not saying yeah. get rid of the guy. I mean, he, he, yeah, he, just he's, he's uh, put up a silo, a silo between the business and yeah. a silo you know, yeah, with the football. Exactly. Can't you create some sort of an organizational chart that says, you know, I don't know what the titles would be, but Wood handles the business part of it, mm -hmm. and then this other guy who they don't have right. is is your football guy, your football yeah. football guru, not the GM, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, but now I mean. A president of football operations of some you know, sort. I, 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 I don't like I don't like this notion of having these bean counters. And I hate to, I know it's yeah. a very dismissive term, but I don't like that. I don't like that idea. The Lions have done that for so many years, and, mm -hmm. and, and it hasn't. I don't know what what that brings them. I don't know what that what the. I don't know what that's all about. I really yeah. don't. I, 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 I don't know. Uh, they, they've just uh, refused to bring in a, a bona fide football guy. To run the football side of things, and I, yeah. I know you can say, well, Bob Quinn was that guy. Okay, fine. Okay, maybe he was, but maybe there's got to be somebody else that just really is the football guy. Yeah. Even the GM reports to him. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know. I, 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 I know that's creating maybe too many layers of, 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 of management, but it just seems like that. In football, it, it, it makes it, sense. It, it seems to work. It seems to work out everywhere else. All the other yeah. successful franchises have football people at the yeah. top. Not these business people who nobody, nobody's ever heard of. Right. They've got football people running the football thing. Yeah, it's uh, and, and and who knows what's going to happen. That we'll we'll find out more when you know when this hiring process starts to move forward. Right now, they're, they're still in a, in a they, there's if there's anybody they want to talk to, the only people they can talk to are people who are out of the game right now. So. You know, and obviously college coaches would be an open game too. But you don't want to hire a coach till you know who your general manager is going to be, or for that right. matter, if you're going to have, as we mentioned, a 
a, a guy higher up, a president of operations above the GM, you know, the last thing we should be talking about right now is who the head coach is going to be because we got to get the layers above him settled first. Uh, you know, you don't want to saddle a GM with a coach. And we saw what happened with Quinn and, 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 uh, and Caldwell. You know, when you, you know, and that essentially led us to almost five years of wasted football. The first two, we had a GM who didn't want that coach. And then we had three, almost three more years of a GM bringing in an unqualified coach, as it turned out. So, oh, my God, this team, Greg, it's killing us. You know, it's – I don't know at this point, but it's – I have kind of checked out on the season. I mean, I'm still watching the games, but I'm not very – I don't – I'm not, you know, not getting very emotionally involved in these games right now. And – there was points where I'm, I was actively rooting against the Lions, and that, that's that's because that's very that's happened a few times in the past, and it's always because the team has become such so dysfunctional, such a losing organization that you're so desperate for change that you're actively rooting against the team that's been your team since you were a young child. And I hate being in that position, but that's where the Lions have put us at this point. So. I'm glad he's. I'm glad they've blown it up to a point so far, but now we're at a point like, what's next? And it's kind of terrifying to think where they could go with this because we don't we don't have any kind of history with Sheila Ford Hamp as to what she's going to do. You know, right. she's saying all the right things, but yeah. William Clay Ford and Martha Ford said all the right things at times as well, and look where we're at. So. Anything you'd like to add before we start talking about another team that's blowing it up big time? <laughs> before we start talking about uh, the Pistons, though, let's talk. Let's give uh, clue number two of the uh, birthday. All right, game. fire see away. Can, see if you can win that uh, seat from uh, Jari Park. Mm. Uh, this person was born in 1948. Like I said, big time slugger in the National League West. Uh, MVP the whole nine yards. Silver slugger. Mm. Um, one of the most feared hitters uh, in baseball for a time. Um, he started off with the Giants, I will tell you that. Okay. But made his, had his big years with another NL, NL West team before eventually playing for the Mets. I think that's what he even played for the White Sox toward the end of his career. But this man was was um, lights out. Uh, not a great defender, but okay. He was a mm -hmm. left fielder. And uh, he was an African American, I will, I will tell you that. Left fielder, played with the Giants in the 70s, and played, and then ended, ultimately bounced around the, the NL West. Well, no, 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 well, you meant, you, I, well, what I said yeah. was he started with the Giants, but had right. big, big years, years with another team another in the team. NL West. That's right. where he won the MVP award. Right, and then ended up with the, with the, uh, with the Mets. Yeah. Oh, Jesus. It's probably one I will know and probably kick myself if I don't get it. A black left fielder. Well, yeah, yeah. Um, Barry Bonds? No, no, that no, wouldn't be Barry no, Bonds. No, no. Oh God, Dusty Baker? No, no. no. Uh, you know, yeah, it's. Uh, I, I, I'm, I, I'm kind of out of ideas at this point. Who? Oh, that's right. We got question three, which is always the gimme. So, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah I keep it. Just, yeah, I'm like, oh, just God damn it, tell me. No, we have another question which will embarrass me even further when it becomes <laughs> obvious who it was. But all right, we got to, we got to move on to the Pistons. Who, who are a little further along than the Lions, who Lions are essentially, as much as Bob Quinn and Matt Patricia tried to convince us it was a rebuild, it really wasn't. We are a team that looks like they have fully embraced they are in a rebuild after essentially they should have been rebuilding or going back to around 2010, when you think about it. Yet they have muddled along trying to stay competitive for that number eight seed in the NBA playoffs for the past decade. Well, uh, that has changed considerably over the past couple weeks with the uh, NBA draft. And uh, the Pistons walked into the NBA draft, I think, with just a one single first-round pick in the, uh, the number seven pick. And when the dust was settled, Greg, from, when the draft, from the draft to free agency to where we are today, uh, the, the number of moves that general manager Troy Weaver made would takes up an entire page of, of a Word document. He, oh, well, think of it this way. The only players left on last, from last season's team are Blake Griffin, who was completely untradeable because of his contract, 
Derrick Rose, who will likely be traded sometime this year to a team that needs a point guard coming off the bench. Uh, and then two young players, Seku Dumbaya and Svi Mahaluk. That's it. Yeah, there are 11 other players, gone. For the most part, I think anybody who was on a two-way deal, gone. Pending free agents, like Christian Wood, gone. Uh, and it's interesting to what uh, Troy Weaver did. Because there was a lot of worry, Greg, that you know maybe he was just going to be a yes man for... Uh, oh God, who's the... Who was the guy who hired him? Uh, Ed Stefanski. I'm sorry, Ed yeah, Stefanski, yeah. who who was essentially the GM the last couple of years, even though he was uh, cons- his title was senior advisor, and he's the guy that hired Weaver. And it's it was refreshing. This it was obvious. He said, "This is your this is your team. You do what you feel you need to do." <laughs> and he essentially went to the fr- took the franchise with a uh, went went out with a flamethrower and went scorched earth. Uh, yeah. you know he really did. You know between like draft night, they ended up with one pick in the number seven. They ended up with three first round picks and a second round pick. Uh, they, oh, I, I, I think I wrote it down here in the notes. Yeah, since from the date from when the draft started, there has been seven trades, four draft picks, five free agent signings, and two of the uh, moves were of the they they acquired a player, and then they waived him and stretched out the contract. Uh, that's a hell of a lot to do in like four or five days, <laughs> which is essentially the vast majority of that has went down. And, you know, and we it's going to be kind of hard to get into all the moves. We can touch on some of the bigger ones. But a couple of takeaways from his move, so Greg, was obviously we, we have found out, you know, lotteries have changed now where the worst team does not get an overwhelmingly good shot to number one pick. It is weighted so much differently now that, you can win 30 games, 35 games, and still get a very, very good pick. It's happened over the last couple years. So he's uh, Weaver looks like he wants to have a team that's not god-awful. This is probably not going to be a playoff team, but this looks like a team that's not going to completely look, be awful to watch. This looks like a team that could win 25, 20 to 30 games, you know. This is not a, this is not a Sixers the process situation where they won, what, six games one year, something ridiculous like that. This has actually got some legit talent on here. It looks like he's also betting on his own player development skills. I mean, that's one of the things OKC, where he's from, um, uh, Oklahoma City's franchise, has always prided themselves as a team that's been able to find guys who weren't top lottery picks and and make them – they, they found some great, great players. I mean – that team was built all around draft picks, and the vast majority of uh, of them were middle of the first round kind of guys, you no know, lower first round guys. They weren't lottery picks, so I think he's kind of betting on that. Out of all these guys he, he's picked, and the majority of the guys that he got in free agency are highly athletic. They can play multiple positions. They're known to known be able to play defense, and they're all they all good citizens. Uh, hard workers, blue collar guys that would fit right in in Detroit when it comes to that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So it's uh, it, it was fascinating to watch happen. It was uh, a nice relief for when uh, my phone was would be blowing up with notifications, but it wasn't because of what was going on in politics. It was because of what was going on with the local team, and they're like, oh my god, what do you do now? It was kind of exciting for. That was probably the most exciting. Draft day and post draft that we've had in this town since I can even remember, you know, of all the moves that were made. And, you know, who knows if it's all going to work? But it's obvious he has a plan. And even, and as the beat writers were telling us, as this was all going down, and people were like, well, why the hell did they trade for him? Or why are they doing this? And they were all like, Wait till the season starts, because what you see today is probably not going to be the same thing as you see next week. So, and that's literally what happened. I mean, there were some guys that were essentially Pistons for less than twenty-four hours. They were either, you know, they were they were either uh, traded or cut, their contracts stretched or whatever. You know, they, they so, you know, they had at one point I think five centers on the roster. Yeah. Uh, obviously, they ended up getting rid of a couple of them finally. But you know, it's it was. It's, there's a plan here. I'm not. I'm not sure we know the full extent of what Weaver wants to do, but it's obvious he's got in his head. He knows what he wants this team to look like, where he wants to go with this team, and the fact that 
he does, he still wants to put, if not a playoff team on the floor, he wants to put a team on the floor that will not embarrass themselves. And I can't argue with that plan at this point. Well, you know, um, if you, you want to change, you got it. And, 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 yeah. You know, we'll see. I mean, now it's up to Dwayne Casey to yeah. try to, you know, make make something out of this uh, this roster makeup here. Um, you know, you mentioned the 20 to 30 game victory total, which, you know, what the Pistons really need to do, Al, is, is come closer to that 9 and 73 Sixers team you were talking about, mm-hmm. win 13, 14, 15 games, and really put themselves. I know that the way that the NBA lottery is now it doesn't guarantee you. I understand that you, know, you have the worst record in the league. It doesn't guarantee you the number one pick like you used to do in the old days. Well, um, we saw that like in the NHL, the Wings ended up picking fourth. Yeah, so yeah. I, and I get it, um, but you got to be, you know, they've got to. <laughs> I really still believe, despite all these moves that Weaver made, yeah. and, we'll, and we'll see, but I really believe that, that their best route is to win 15 games. Tr- you know, try to get you know, a, a top two two or three pick by hook or by crook somehow get a franchise player, um, a franchise guy, which they haven't done in uh, who knows how. I don't even remember mm-hmm. the last time the Pistons drafted a franchise guy, frankly. I really don't. Yeah. But, um, you know, it might have been Isaiah Thomas. I don't know. But they, they've got a Grand Hill, actually. Nobody liked that. I mean, yeah. you know, the killing hazes of the world and, and some of the other guys are probably, you know, some of these guys are probably going to be pretty good NBA players. Okay, mm-hmm. I, I won't grant you, but they're not, they're not guys you're going to build a team around. They're not going to lead you. To, you got to have that superstar. I know that sounds like a broken record because it's, but it's true. The NBA, that's the way the NBA is. You, mm-hmm. it's a star-driven league. I mean, the, the, the rosters are only you only have twelve players to begin with, and there's only five players on the floor anyway. So it's a very star-driven. <laughs> league and you, you yep. cannot go out you can't scrap your way with a bunch of hard workers this isn't the go to work days of the mid 2000s you got to have star power out sheer star power and uh, to to be to be relevant yep. or else you're going to be in that 20 to 30 win thing and occasionally bob up to 40 wins maybe and but they need they don't have you know they, they haven't been able to really draft a guy out who's mm-hmm. going to really turn this town on and well, well i think what they're betting on though i know it's it's chancy you know like um but i think they're think, hoping that they'll because the draft tends to be a crap shoot anyway that they're going to find that franchise player a little lower in the draft you know like the greek freak was like a, a 15th round yeah, uh, 15th yeah. Uh, overall pick for example yeah no you I, know I, that's I, yeah. I, that's what you kind of have to, i think that's what they're kind of betting on is that if we don't end up high in the draft, I have enough belief in my player evaluation skills that I'm going to find those gems in the draft. Because, I mean, look what OKC drafted. You know, they drafted uh, Kevin Durant and, uh, oh, God, what was the big three they had there? Westbrook, they're, they're and, Westbrook and Harden. Yeah. All, all draft picks, and they were all high lottery picks. So I guess we're hoping for uh, – or Miami's kind of done the same thing as well over the, you know, since – my, since uh, uh, LeBron James left and, the, and Dwayne Wade's retired and, kind of, and the whole that roster broke up, they made it to the finals this year on essentially player development. I mean, you know, when the, you know they don't really, they, you know, they've uh, they have. Uh, if you're not going to be able to attract high level free agents, you have to be able to draft well. It helps if you're drafting high, high up. But you can't always, because of luck, because of the ping pong balls, uh, because of other teams. Some, you know, sometimes you have to make your own luck, and that usually comes by mining high-level ball players lower in the draft. And I think that's what the Pistons seem to be betting on. I mean, it's not who's no guarantee it's going to work, but it's uh, that looks like they're going for the OKC Miami model, and that's not a bad one to emulate when you're not uh, a big market team in warm weather. Well, you know, Dwayne Casey, of course, he's saying all the right things. He, he and yeah. Troy Weaver are both very, 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 very high on these these kids they brought in both via the draft and, and trade. They really, and that's fine. Okay, good. Yeah. That's that's great. You know, I I, I, I don't know what I what else I would expect them to say, of course, but they really are very high on these guys as people, yeah. and um, that's fine too. Uh, but um, you know, this is 
this is we'll see. I mean, I, yeah. I, I don't know how you handicap this team. I really don't. There's yeah, there's, there's so many unknowns, and it's yeah. they, they have no they've had no chance to work out because of uh, right. because of COVID restrictions and the season's right. like a month away, less than a month away. Like right. what? Three weeks away <laughs> when you think about it. Right. You know, it's uh, what the twenty second of this month. So right. Holy shit! The things are going to start moving quick here, right. and you're and some of these guys, like you said, they're 19, 20 year old. They're going to be thrown to the wolves, which makes sense. Is that you can't, you know, even if you want to tank, you can't take with an entire team full of 19 year olds. You need some experienced yeah. guys, in which that's what Tor Weaver has gotten. Guys like uh, uh, Plumley and uh, uh, the, the, the Okafor and Jackson yeah. Grant, who I think was the guy essentially right. who replaces Christian Wood. Right. So you know, Wayne Ellington. You know, these are all from right. from good locker room guys. Hard nosed guys. At, at the very least, we're, I think we're going to see a team that's going to scrap. Who knows if they're going to be any good or not? But, right. but, uh, but you know, it, when you said about drafting this this organization, drafting franchise players, I, I started kind of thinking about it. I can only come up with four: Dave Bing, Bob Lanier, Isaiah Tom. Oh, maybe five, maybe six. Now that I'm thinking about. It. Okay, Bing, Lanier, uh, Isaiah Thomas, Joe Dumars. Uh, Dennis Rodman, probably, and Grant Hill. And Grant Hill, I think, would be the last true all-pro. I mean, the team has had, you know, all-stars and all-pros since then, but almost all of them have either been found in free agency or by a trade. I think the last one I can think of that they actually drafted, uh, that was an actual star, not a role player like right. uh, Tayshaun Prince, was uh, Grant Hill. Yeah. When you think about it. Yeah. Yeah, so it's been a long time since we had a franchise, a kid come in and become that franchise player. Right. You know, and who knows if any of these guys will. I mean, you know, it'd be nice to think that they would, but the odds are against them. I'll, we'll just say it that way. So, but still, it's it's he had the Grant has a plan. I mean, Weaver has a plan. He's starting to implement that plan, and it looks like. Uh, Stefanski and Gores have given him free reign to essentially he can he's going to hang himself by his own petard or be successful. So I guess that's all you can ask for as a GM is that you're you're allowed to implement your vision, go to it, and that right now I think and and the one thing to keep in mind all of these contracts I don't think anybody uh, is under contract uh, the free agents and the guys who brought him for your trade. None of them are under contract for more than three years. So that kind of has, I think right now we're looking at a three-year window where this team is going to figure out where they're going and who they have and what they need. And I think the plan is two to three years from now, they'll have a better idea as to what we need, who we can go for, and, and move from there. So we'll see what happens. But it was, too, a fun, it was a fun weekend, I'll say that much. The other thing that, that, that hamstrings them as well mm -hmm. Um, you know, we, we, we were talking a lot about the draft and, and so mm -hmm. forth. But one of the things that really hamstrings the Pistons as well is that they are not and have not been for a very long time a destination of yeah. choice for any sort of big-time free agent that you would even want to consider uh, signing. Right. Um, you know, they would never be able to go out, for example, and, and just flat-out sign Blake Griffin if he was right. a, you know just a, a, a flat-out free agent. They had mm -hmm. to trade to get him to absorb right. that contract uh there isn't there aren't too many players around the league that that say you know i want out of here and i want to go to detroit i mean nobody right. says that <laughs> and they, they haven't said that a very very long time mm -hmm. and when you can't attract um because sometimes you have to do that sometimes you have to go outside the organization to to, 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 to bring in someone right and they just, you know, and I'm not talking about a guy like Derrick Rose is a million years old who's, who's, you know, who you're really not outbidding anybody to get his services for. Right. I'm talking about a real big time guy who really mm -hmm. wants to, you know, take his talent somewhere else. And it, whether because he's sick of where he's at or, or doesn't like what's going on and wants to go somewhere else and, and be successful. They never think, they never say Detroit ever. Right. I, I can't, that's another thing. We're, you're sitting here talking about, Gosh, when was the last time they, they, they drafted a, a impact player? I'm mm -hmm. not even going to say franchise, but impact. When was right. the last time they went out and signed a free agent who was really 
I consider that you know around the league as being whoa, you know I that's a that's a star player that's going to Detroit. I can't remember that either. Yeah, and that's what yeah, happens right. when, you, when you when you're irrelevant for twelve years like the Pistons have been. Oh well, yeah, I mean, and a lot of things have changed in twelve years. A lot I mean, yeah. the, way, the way that the contracts are, the way that you build a team, the way you build a roster are not the same now as they were twelve years ago. For a lot right. of reasons, the CBA has changed. The the, the landscape has changed. There's so many things that have changed yep. in 12 years in the NBA the last time the Pistons won a playoff game. Um, you know, there's just a whole different set of rules now. And But I, all I know is that nobody wants to come to Detroit willingly. Nobody says, hey, yeah. I, let me, I want to I like how you, how you put it. No one willingly comes right. to Detroit. You know, you, you think Blake <laughs> but Griffin, I know exactly what you're saying. Yeah. You think Blake Griffin was, was in L.A.? No, no, you're right. The, if he was going to go to a bad team, he'd want to go to a bad team in a huge uh, market like New York. Saying to his people out there, you know, uh, you know, uh, get me out of here and put, get, get, send me to Detroit. I, I don't want to be in flyover country. Yeah. Now, in his defense, he has been a good soldier. I mean, he yeah. came over. Yes. I've, I've not, I've not heard anything about him being a bad teammate. I've not heard anything about him being a bad, a bad apple uh, at right. all. Uh, you know, I, yeah. I, I, I really, I, I have to tip my cap to him because, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sure that was not an easy thing for him to do. I know he says, well, I'm a Midwestern guy and everything. I'm, I'm, well, that's fine. But his career post-basketball. Will be out in the West up. Coast. Yeah. You know, he wants to be a comedian. He wants to act. He wants to do all well, What else are you going to do that but L.A.? Mm -hmm. Now he's coming to Detroit. So to an organization that hasn't won anything. Right. So I, I really, I applaud his attitude. I, th yeah. I th And he went out and had a great year. His first full year in Detroit was great. I mean, was yeah, he was. Played out great. Mm -hmm. And, um. You know, so you got to. He, he, he took that team on his back and put him in the playoffs. He really yeah, did. And, he was, and, he, and not a not a peep of, of, of anything. There was no yeah. hint that he was unhappy. There was no. He wasn't disgruntled. Mm -hmm. He wasn't bitter. Uh, he went out and, and gave 110 percent every night, which which in, which endeared him to the fans, of course. And he became a favorite of the fans. Yeah. And they became they, they started a cobble. He and the fans started a cobble, a little bit of a of a relationship there. Mm -hmm. Where he kind of became one of he kind of became a Detroiter, yeah. you know. Which is, and what I mean by that is he was that hardworking, no nonsense. I'm not going to complain, guy. And well, there was no prima donna about him whatsoever. Yeah, the, was, you, yeah, you could call that the Pistons ethos at this point. That's the yeah. kind of players that the fan base loves. Right, and and he was not only the best player, yeah. but probably the the hardest worker. And whenever yeah. your best player is also your hardest worker, as a coach, that's a coach's dream. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, and if he wants to get out, ultimately, you got he's got to play his way out and make himself a valuable piece of uh, trade because that thirty some million dollar contract right now is an albatross in that you're not going to be able to deal him until he proves that a team is willing because there's still one year left after this year. He's got two years left. So, you know, if the yeah, which again plays into this Pistons rebuild is that you know they know even if they can't trade him. He's off the books in two years, and that is going to free up about thirty to thirty-five million dollars. And you know, well, and who knows what they can do in free agency at that point. So, and but yeah, the, too, it's, uh, the, 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 iron, the irony about this whole Grant, uh, yeah, this whole uh, Blake Griffin thing, yeah, is that he was the, the only reason he was brought here to begin with. Well, it was a hail mary. Yep. By by Stan Van Gundy to keep his job here. Yeah. That was that's all that was. That was a hail mary. I'm going to show the boss that I can bring in a genuine superstar here. Yep. I don't care what it does to my books. I don't care what it, how, how much it handcuffs the organization for the next four years. I'm just going to – this was a Hail Mary by Stan Van Gundy. He was in his last year of his contract, and I'm yep. just going to throw the, throw this Hail Mary out there and hope that it, it works, and it, and it didn't. Yeah, and if it doesn't work, I'm fired anyway. You know, I don't have to deal with the fallout. Yeah, right. Yeah. But he had nothing to lose. Stan had nothing to lose. I yeah, mean, you know, he did. You know, he's like, well, if I'm going to be out of here anyway, I may yeah. as well, uh, you know, coach Blake Griffin for 30 games. Yeah, go down in flames, as yeah. they said. And he definitely did that. But um, it's going to be an interesting season with the Pistons. It's hard to believe. Yeah, all of a sudden I looked at the calendar like, shit, they start in three weeks. So, and who, know, and who knows if they'll really start in three weeks because of what's going on with the pandemic and – as we're seeing in the NFL, it looks to be at a breaking point. Before we even touch on that a little bit before we wrap up the show, 
Uh, Miles will hopefully give me a gimme when it comes to question three of the birthday game. <laughs> well, I think it will be. Uh, this player um, started with the Giants, but had his big years with the Reds. With the big uh, Reds team. Left fielder. Hit 52 home runs one year. I already know. I know it's George Foster. George Foster. Yeah. Foster. I completely Foster. forgot he didn't start with the Reds. Right. That's the thing. Yeah, because like you said, his big years, he was uh, – he hit 50 home runs when no one hit 50 home runs. Right. Yeah. Right. No steroids, no nothing. Yep. Just greenies, probably. <laughs> <laughs> God damn it. So I, I don't get that. Uh, I was hoping maybe get an autog- that sh- uh, chair autographed by Bill Lee or Dennis Martinez. Or... <laughs> but, oh, well, you know. So uh, maybe next time. You know, put that, put that one on the back burner. Maybe we'll try it again. All right, before we wrap it up, we do have to touch what's going on with um, COVID-19 in that there's been a lot of, well, like the NCAA football. You know, it's funny. Well, I'll bring up, a, I'll bring up my, the, the app, my scoreboard app my, on my phone, see what's you know, it's checking the scores. And every week in college football, for example, there's more than a dozen, dozen, 15 games either canceled or postponed. Uh, Wisconsin, University of Wisconsin, even though I believe they're undefeated right now, are ineligible for the Big Ten title because they're not going to be able to play enough games. You know, so Michigan for uh, this week had to shut down for a day due to uh, a, uh, to a possible outbreak. Turned out there was just one one person tested positive, so they they restarted practice. But going the way Michigan played, everybody was kind of hoping they'd be they'd have to shut down for a significant amount of time. But it's been even weirder. You know, as bad as it's been in, in the NCAA. And who knows what it's going to be like for college basketball because there's going to be a bit more traveling involved. But the NFL, Greg, has been bonkers over the past week. Uh, I, I alluded to the Broncos earlier in the, bo- in the broadcast when I made a joke about their needing four quarterbacks. Well, that's actually what happened. They were forced to play the Saints with a practice squad wide receiver uh, under center as they ended up with all four of their quarterbacks, their three roster guys, and their practice squad quarterback, all ended up on the COVID-19 list due to one of the quarterbacks uh, testing positive, and the other three ignored best practices and were caught on camera hanging out with the guy in, you know, in, a, in a small meeting room, uh, not wearing their masks, not taking precautions, not social distancing, and the NFL essentially threw the hammer down and dropped the hammer on them and refused to move the game because they said, this is your negligence. This is your fault. You have a complete – you have a, a, a – every player in this position group cannot be used because of your own negligence. And I guess also played into it is that they lied about it as well. That they, As the NFL put it, they were not forthcoming about their contact tracing. And I guess they also weren't wearing their, their – I guess when they're in the facility, they need to wear um, tracking devices, which, you know, which will let them know who's near who and things like that. So because the Broncos tried to have a, an assistant coach who was a former college quarterback, and the NFL said, no, we're not doing that because that opens up a door for teams to hide players that way. And right. so they ended up, luckily, they, I wouldn't say luckily, but they had a former, a guy who played what, uh, I think he was a quarterback his freshman year at Wake Forest, converted to wide receiver, and he ended up having to play quarterback for the Broncos, and I think it was like one of 13 with two picks for 13 yards or something like that. And then we have the other cluster, Greg, has been what's going on with the Steelers-Ravens game. That game was supposed to be played Thanksgiving night. Due to an outbreak on the Ravens team, it's been moved from Thursday night. I think it was moved to Sunday. Then it was bumped to, t- t- supposed to happen as we are recording this. And now it's been bumped till tomorrow afternoon, all because there's been an outbreak on the Ravens roster. They have had nine straight days of people in the organization with positive tests. So, and then the Steelers have been all, this is like the second or third time this year, the Steelers have like lost a bye week. They've been jerked around big time by this through no fault of their own due to other organizations having issues of outbreaks. I mean, it really kind of, no, you know what the NFL, they're going to try and power through it no matter what. But it's starting to feel like they're kind of at a tipping point right now when it comes to what's going to happen because... 
you know, the, the, between the farce that was the Broncos situation and essentially screwing over the Steelers because of what's going on with the Ravens, oh, man, there is the I, the NFL is uh, kind of being exposed that the their only plan they had was hell or high water. We're going to play every game, and if that means moving games to Wednesday afternoon at three o'clock. That's what we're going to do. It's kind of ridiculous, but that's where we are in this new normal. It's bonkers. Yeah, and um, yeah, and and you mentioned college uh, at the college level. Um, mm-hmm. Of course, we know it's happened local high school level as well. Um, you know, that's what I mean. That's it's a, obviously it's a highly heavily high contact sport, and yeah, and uh, I kind of laugh when I see these players on the sidelines wearing their masks when they're out there breathing on each other during the course of the game. I don't yeah. know why they bother putting their mask on on the sidelines, but um, yeah, I mean, hey, you know. Oh, and there's I one understand. other thing I forgot to mention: the uh, the 49ers have to play their next two home games in Arizona because uh, things have gotten so bad in right. their area that they've banned all everything, you know, contact yeah. sports and close con- anything close contact in their county. So now they're playing in Arizona for the next two weeks. It's you know that's uh, you know I'm I'm we're I'm actually stunned that it's not worse than it already is. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with you. And, and you know, but when you look around the league, the good teams are the good teams, and the bad yeah. teams are the bad teams as they expected them to be. The only kind of weirdness that's going on is the you know the nfc east with right you know the, the cowboys are three and eight and are still in the playoff on they, they can still win the, <laughs> yeah, the, whole, the whole nfc east is, is yeah. bonkers other than that uh you know you look around the league everybody who you would expect to be good is good everybody who you would expect to be so so is so so mm. you know the jets nobody knew that everybody thought the jets would be bad and they are everybody thought the jaguars would be bad and they are yeah. Um, there's a couple, maybe a couple surprises in there, but there are anyway. I mean, there's, there, mm-hmm. there are in any given NFL season. So from that standpoint, it, the, the, the COVID thing hasn't really thrown the standings asunder. I mean, they're pretty much, everybody's still, you know, the goods are the goods and the bads are the bads. But, mm-hmm. um, you know, we'll see what happens as this thing goes on. The, the, at least with the NFL, though, they've got, they've got a lot of wiggle room. They've got, you know, they, they, this, the schedule, of course, under normal circumstances, ends in the first week of February. They don't have any, under normal circumstances, don't have anything going on, mm-hmm. OTAs or anything like that, till May, June, July. They have a long off season. So they could, if they needed to, they, they could stretch things out. If they, if they needed to kind of let things settle down a little bit, they could even take two or three weeks off right. between the regular season, for example, and the playoffs and, and have a Super Bowl in March or something. And it wouldn't really impact anything. It really it wouldn't impact the draft. The draft isn't until late April. They've got a lot of, they've got a lot of uh, room at the end of the schedule, <laughs> unlike baseball, mm-hmm. which has got this ticking time bomb, which is the weather. So you, you know, you 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 got to get the games in because you're also playing in snow. But right. the NFL has got, they got time. They they can really stretch this thing out if they wanted to. They I mean and they, and and they probably should. I mean, there's there's nothing that says you have to have the Super Bowl. Um, I know that's another, which is another thing, by the way, is the Super mm-hmm. Bowl, and that, that, I mean, that's, you know, I, I you know, it's that's going to be another big thing too, is to determine how they're going to handle that. Would, would they dare have a Super Bowl with no fans? Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you sure, if you have, mm-hmm. if you have. I mean, you, you know, I mean, they may have no choice. Well, they're, are they just going to defy everything? Oh, screw, we're going to pack seventy-five thousand fans in the stadium. No, there's going to yep. be a Super Bowl probably played with no fans. That's just the way it is. I mean, that's just, I mean, so, but we'll see. But the NFL does have some space where they can kind of stretch out the playoffs if they have to. Maybe give, maybe allow a couple of weeks in between games if they have to. Because yep. as, as, the, as the playoffs go on, you only have a handful of teams left anyway. So it's not like you're affecting all 32 mm-hmm. teams by doing that. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, and let's not even get into, like, uh, the NHL, which is going to have an all-Canadian division because – they, people, they can't cross. We can't cross the border. Yeah. So yeah, it, it's looking like the Wings are going to probably end up it'd be looking like they're back in the Western Conference again. Probably right. be stuck in the same division like the Blackhawks and the Stars and a few other teams like that with a bunch of Central Time Zone teams. 
that's going to be a very weird year between the N- NBA is going to have this compressed season and the NHL is going to have these this realignment and all the Canadian teams just got to play themselves and this new normals. I'm not still not used to this new normal to say the right. very least. Right. All right. Uh, with all our ranting and raving done, I guess it's time for one more rant. So who is your jerk of the week? Well, my jerk of the week, Al, is is uh and i I really shouldn't be surprised by this but uh, it's the the once again the misogynism on full display um when Mm -hmm. sarah fuller made uh Ah. news as the uh, first uh female to play um power five in a power five football game as as a place kicker Mm -hmm. and you know and i know that twitter is not is, is a cesspool i understand that but you know i went on twitter and i looked at some of the uh, tweets and, and misogynistic um, sexism is still alive and well. Um, you know, everything from well, why can't guys, well then why can't guys play softball? Yeah. Why can't guys play uh, female sports? Then why you know and then or or to besmirch her because she's a kicker and he's not really a player and you know one of these guys should just pancake her and that'll be the end of that and mm-hmm. I, I I just the. I, I don't know the the, the uh, insecurity of, of men yeah. to to slow pitch not slow pitch but play softball against girls like and yeah. women really I mean is that, is that your comeback when you've got baseball I mean softball is the female you can say what you will it's the female version of baseball it's mm-hmm. the it's the female version of baseball at the college level so now you want you think that because Sarah Fuller's kicking for Vanderbilt, that now we have to have men play softball. Yeah, I, you know, I just, I don't know if some of these things were, were sarcastic and, and people weren't really meaning it, but I, I know that some of them were. And it's just, it's, it's very discouraging when you see, you know, you think you've come a long way and, and, and so forth, and then you see, you're reminded that there are these idiots out there that just, they just can't let it go. They can't, yeah. they just can't wrap their heads around the fact that this, this woman, young lady. Is out there performing and, and competing with the guys, um, and nobody's saying that she, she's not a defensive end. Yep. She's not, a, she's not a, a safety or a. She's a kicker. Okay, fine. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm not saying I'm not saying that's the only position that a female could could excel in in football. But we're starting to see more females, female coaches in football, for example, mm-hmm. uh, even in the on the NFL level. Yeah. So I, I just it just it bothers me that we're still in that thing that says. Oh, if you're going to play, if you're going to kick for Vanderbilt, then now we've got to have every guy who wants to play softball play softball with the ladies. I just, I, I don't understand that. How insecure yeah. are you? Oh, yeah, I'm. You really nailed it. Because why can't we just enjoy something cool and yeah, neat right. and you know something we've never seen before? You know, a glass, a glass ceiling being broken. You know, and yet there was people that were more than happy to shit all over it. Yeah. You know, just to essentially make themselves feel better about their little lives, I guess. And, you know, it's, you know, I think over the last four years, we've seen people have become emboldened with these uh, misogynistic and hateful takes when it comes to different races and cultures and, you know, and and women. So I'm with you there. That was a good point because... Uh, you know, I was hoping to see a field goal attempt at an extra point. Unfortunately, Vanderbilt's really, really bad, so all she was able to do was have a kickoff. But I was hoping to see, to see an extra point or something. But more credit to her. I think that's – and the thing is, she probably did better than I even you know that I could have done at that age, you know. You know what I'm saying? And that's what gets me, you know, when it comes to talking about fans being stupid. Now, how many times have you seen online or you've heard people on, you know, on sports talk radio say – uh, oh, you could put me on the field. I could do just as well. And then we saw what happened in Denver, where you had an elite athlete, a guy who had played, was an all-state, all-world, highly recruited quarterback in high school, played quarterback at a Power 5 school as a freshman, made the NFL as a wide receiver, and yet looked completely and utterly lost as an NFL quarterback. Even though he had every possible physical skill you would need so it just kind of drives home the point that people who you know college athletes especially at power five schools be it men or women 
they're at a different level than us, period. You know, like when I played high school ball, I knew that was going to be the peak of my of my athletic prowess. I knew I wasn't good enough to play at the next level. I didn't have the strength. I didn't have the speed. You know, so uh, you're right. It's, you know, there's too many people, I think, too many Al Bundys, I think is the best way to put it in this world, who uh, guys who had, you know, who played in high school or played in junior high or played in rec league and think, oh, yeah, I could kick, you know, like the ones who say they, I could, you know, you put me on, this, on the court against uh, uh, on, against women at a you know, at uh, universities, you know, women who play at a Power 5 school for basketball or something. They'd kick our ass all over the place because they just shoot threes right over the top of us. So, yeah, I'm with you there. It was very disappointing to see. All right, I'm going to... Usually, I'm the one who goes with the more controversial <laughs> topics when it comes to the Jerk of the Week. But I'm going to revert back to sports a little bit. My Jerk of the Week, Greg, are going to be the Tampa Bay Rays and specifically their ownership. Uh, the Rays, who all came this close to winning the World Series this last year and have the 28th highest payroll in baseball, they're looking to dump salary after making it to the goddamn World Series. Blake Snell, a Cy Young winner a couple years ago, yeah. uh, and he's actually on a, for a guy of his talent level, of his resume, is actually on a pretty much a bargain contract. He still has three years and $35 million left on his, $39 million left on his deal. It's too, it looks like it's too rich for the Rays, and the Rays are, taking, are looking to take offers. They're willing to move on. Uh, they're, uh, Kevin Kiermeyer, they're... Uh, uh, their gold glove center fielder who's making uh, about $11 million a year for the next two years, he's on the block. Uh, they let uh, one, of their, the, one of the guys in the rotation, they already let walk. What's that? Uh, Charlie Moore, I believe. Uh, they let him walk. Morton? What's that? Morton. Charlie Morton. Charlie Morton, right. Uh, he, was, uh, he, made, he was making uh, – he ended up going to the Braves for one year, $15 million for – you no, know, a, a legit starting pitcher is not that expensive, but it just goes to show that Greg, that you know these teams are owned by billionaires or billionaire consortiums, and they all they are. It's if, I'd hate to be a fan of a team like the Rays, who have ownership that refuses to spend any kind of money, and to the point where they get successful, and they have players who are either going are on the verge of having some nice contracts, or even a guy like um, uh, you know a guy like Snell who's making good money, but not all world money, and they still claim they can't afford it when they easily could. It's just they just don't want to spend the money. You know, they, because, you know you know, if you know, if I was the owner of a team like you know, say good or bad, of Mike Illich, he ran the Tigers like I don't care if I make money, I just want to win, and if we break even, perfect. You know, that's the kind of ownership you would love to see of a of a major league franchise or any sports franchise. Yet the vast majority of them, Greg, come off like the Rays, where if we're not raking in hundreds of millions of dollars of profit every year. Well, we just got to blow it up and get cheap again. I mean, you see it with uh, Cleveland. You see it with Tampa Bay. Um, you, 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 we're going to see it with uh, help uh, with Minnesota as another team like that. A lot of these, you know, these aren't exactly small markets. I mean, uh, Minneapolis or uh, you know, or you know, these are decent sized metropolises. You know, they're not top ten markets, but they're not like Green Bay for Christ's sake. And to see them. Essentially, you just throw the white flag and say, we just don't want to spend more than $100 million in payroll when, you're, when your team is alone or worth in the billions. You know, it's, it's once again drives home the point. Fans should never, ever, ever take the side of ownership in labor battles between owners and players because when it comes down to it, owners don't care anything other than making money. It's the, there's a few exceptions here and there. But for the vast majority of them, they're like the owners of the Rays, where it comes down to, if we could say, and let's not even remember, Greg, a lot of these teams have laid off vast majority of scouts and front office people and people working in the stadium. Yet, you know, they're billionaires. It's, it's, it's honestly awful to see, and we're going to see more of it because of what's going on with the pandemic, because these organizations see an excuse 
what, what's going on right now. And think it, we now is our chance. We, we're seeing what Major League Baseball is doing in minor leagues as well, where they're ultimately going to end up getting rid of like what 30, 40 teams so they can have more control and save money. So, my jerk of the week is the uh, Tampa Bay Rays ownership for essentially waving a white flag on a talented team because they just don't want to pay the money. It's ridiculous. Good one. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. All right, let's wrap it up. Why don't you get out the uh, thank yous and worth the falls and all the other fun stuff. Sure. Uh, once again, read me at uh, Out of Bounds, my WordPress blog. Uh, I'm, I'm there weekly usually. Follow me on Twitter at Greg Eno. Follow the Knee Jerks on Twitter at the Knee Jerks. Al's going to tell you where uh, you can find the podcast, um, which is pretty much anywhere you, you can. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. If, if there's a... A place that has podcasts, you can find the Nature Jerks on there. We are specifically, we're on Apple Podcasts, we are on Stitcher Radio, we are on iHeart Radio, we're on Spotify, we're on Google Play, Amazon Music, Deezer, Radio Public, YouTube. Go to the kneejerks.net. That's where you'll find uh, all the uh, show notes, all the links to all these different places where, the, uh, where you can find the podcast. You can actually also right-click on the, if you're on your computer, right-click on the link and download the podcast as an MP3, and you can do whatever you want with it. But just take your uh, podcast app of choice, look up the Knee-Jerks, Eno and Big Al. Usually the Knee-Jerks should be enough, and listen to your heart's content. And as they say, like and subscribe and comment and favor and favorite and all that fun stuff and go to town. But... That about covers it, I think. So, uh, God, when we talk next, Greg, we'll be pushing Christmas when, it, when, it come, when you think about it. So, uh, And we'll be pushing uh, the, the start of the NBA season, and we'll be able to talk more about the Daryl yeah. Bevel era of the Detroit Lions football. Yeah. And, um, and hopefully maybe the Tigers will have done something in free agency. We will wait and see. But until then, we'll have, I guess we'll say it's, it'll be our Christmas episode. Uh, this is Al Beaton saying... Good evening, good luck, and aloha. Shower to everybody. We'll see you in two weeks.